Hello and welcome to GameSack. A couple of episodes ago, I was talking about games that are worse than we remember. But now it's time to put a positive spin on that and talk about games that are better than most of us remember. I mean, even if you liked a game back when you first played it, it's still possible to enjoy it more these days with a fresh perspective. Let's start out with an obvious one. At least I think it's obvious anyway. Zelda II The Adventure of Link on the NES wasn't praised as much as the first game when it was new. I mean, it's not like it was hated or anything, but it never got anywhere near as much love as the other games in the series. Part of this is, of course, because they changed the gameplay completely. You now wander around an overhead map in a similar fashion to a JRPG. There are now even random-ish battles that occur. When this happens, you're taken to a side-scrolling level, and usually you just need to wander to the other end whilst killing all of the fiendish enemies who are out to give you a bad day. This was a huge departure from the overhead action of the first game. But you know what? It's actually more fun than I remember it. I don't remember it being awful. It does have some similarities to the first game, such as you starting from a central point and the entire game being pretty much trial and error in regards to figuring out what you need to do next. These days, of course, you can easily cheat with strategy guides, game facts, or by watching YouTube videos. That right there might make this game a lot less cryptic and more enjoyable for lots of people. It's still going to be a challenging game even if you know where to go and what to do, though. You also have a leveling system in this one, which is different from the other Zelda games. This was kind of odd back then, but after playing lots of different games over the years, I've kind of grown to like leveling my characters up with experience points. Here, you have to make a choice on how to level Link up, with more life, maybe more power, or more magic. Oh, and is it me, or is the music in this game just incredible? Don't get me wrong, the game is still a little weird. You have a limited amount of lives, and you can get a game over, which puts you back at the beginning of the game. At least you still have your progress, you just have to make the trek all the way back to where you were. If you go in expecting a basic Zelda adventure, you're probably going to be a little bit let down. But if you go in with an open mind and are looking for something a bit different, hey, it's really kind of fun. USA from Williams was released on the Nintendo 64 in December of 1996, one of the early games on the console. It's basically a game where, as the title implies, you cruise across the entire USA in your car and try to come in first place. The arcade version was released two years prior and it was branded as using the Ultra 64 hardware. If you didn't know, the Ultra 64 was what the Nintendo 64 was called prior to it becoming the Nintendo 64. The arcade game was incredibly successful, even more popular than Daytona USA at the time, if you can believe that. Plus, it gave us a glimpse of how the Nintendo 64 graphics would look. That's right, we'd have graphics this good in the home very soon. Except that we wouldn't, not quite anyway. The actual Nintendo 64 console uses very different hardware and it's not as powerful as the stuff in Williams' arcade machine. Still, they did make a decent attempt to port the game home. Sadly at the time, that attempt didn't seem to be good enough for me. It had slightly twitchy control, and the frame rate was all over the place, usually spending more time on the lower end of the spectrum. The physics were also laughably bad and cheap looking even for their time. I decided to give it a hard pass. But you know what? I played this one recently and hey, I found myself having a pretty good time. Sure, it's far from perfect, but as an arcade racer, it's still enjoyable. I was having lots of fun racing through all of the different areas and less concerned about being grumpy over the graphics. Speaking of which, I'm glad this game isn't a blurry mess like a lot of games on the console. And while the scenery does tend to fade in from the distance, at least everything isn't blanketed with a heavy layer of fog. The sound and music is, well, it's there. It could be worse. Of course, it could certainly be better as well as it's all in mono here. I wish there were more options for the control scheme, but honestly, it doesn't take too long to get used to the ones that are available. I also wish there was a stage based in the Rocky Mountains. How could they forget that? We certainly don't need five plus stages based in California alone. Crashing into other cars will cause you to lose a lot of time, so you need to be careful. If you can pass the starting lineup safely towards the beginning of the race, you'll usually be able to do okay. 
While this game isn't on par with Daytona, Ridge Racer, or OutRun, it's honestly way more fun than I remember it being. And hey, that's good. Here's Herzog's Y for the Genesis, and yes, I pronounce it like an American. What do you want from me? These days, this game gets a lot of praise from pretty much everyone who's played it, and rightfully so. It's one of the first real-time strategy games ever, definitely the first on a console. This was Technosoft's second game on the Genesis, and at the time, people wanted something more like Thunder Force 2. I know I was confused by it at first, but I didn't really get into it until many years later. Then, my friend Bill, who's been on the show before doing console mods, really, really got into it, which made me take another look. And then something clicked. Basically, you're playing against a computer or a friend, and your goal is to destroy the main base of your opponent before they destroy yours. To do this, you need to build and deploy different things. Some of these will help you occupy the little sub-bases that are scattered about so you can work closer and closer to the main enemy base. You want this because you can't just fly around willy-nilly as you'll quickly run out of energy and die. Anyway, your main base or any of the sub-bases that you've occupied, you can build units to attack the main enemy base or defend any of your bases. You'll get to listen to some great tunes while doing all of this and they'll definitely get stuck in your head, at least they do in mine. And for me, anyway, that's a good thing. I won't get any deeper into the gameplay mechanics in this review. It can take a while to learn, but once you do, it's very fun and the hours can just whiz by. So, while it's certainly more fun than I remember it being at first, I wonder what these people who wrote these reviews in Electronic Gaming Monthly think about this game these days. Is it more fun for them than they remember? I mean, wow, look at how low these scores are. Man, I sure hope they took a second look and changed their opinion. Otherwise, they are absolutely missing out for sure. That's right, this segment right here is dedicated to EGM. be a bit biased on this next one but it did take me a while to appreciate it for what it is you know first impressions are important but second and third impressions are perhaps even more important wow that's profound isn't it when sega ported the amazing ghouls and ghosts to the genesis early in its life we were all blown away by how amazing it was it wasn't a pixel-for-pixel -pixel conversion, but it was one of the closest ports we ever saw to a home console for such a modern game at the time. Sega did the port themselves, but their license agreement with Capcom also allowed them to port it to the Master System. And hey, why wouldn't they? Might as well get as much mileage as you can from the license. A while later, I saw it used at a game store for a good price, so I picked it up. Someone must not have liked it very much and traded it in. And the first few times I played it, I was underwhelmed myself. Not only is it a significant downgrade over the Genesis version, but they added stuff like shops where you need to buy different levels of armor, shoes, and helmets. Why the hell did they make this change? I didn't care for that at all, I wanted arcade action. Still, I've held on to the game for all these years. Several years ago, I really started getting back into Ghouls and Ghosts again after I got the Super Graphics version as well as the arcade PCB. I had prided myself on being able to be any port of the game. Well, except for the Master System version, which I had never really gotten very far in. So I plugged it in to give it a go, and you know what? I was actually having a ton of fun. I even liked using the shops. The stages, bosses, and basic gameplay are like the original, but other than that, it's almost a whole new game. Basically, how it works is that you start out pretty weak. When you open certain treasure chests, doors will appear and you'll enter a shop. There's no currency in the game, as the shop owners genuinely want to help you defeat evil so everything is free, but you can only take one item at a time. Getting better armor earns you more hearts, which means you can take more hits before you lose your armor. The shoes will let you run faster and jump further. It's really nice when you get better shoes because the control becomes much improved as a result. The helmet lets you use magic, and better helmets increase your magic gauge and give you more magic attacks. 
The gold items are the best, and the basic silver ones are what you start out with and are, of course, the worst. It takes some time to get all of the best stuff. Sometimes a weapon is offered to you, and of course the dagger is the one that you want. My least favorite thing about the shops is that there's no exit option. You have to choose something, which means you may end up being stuck with the weapon you don't want. Sometimes when you go into the shop, there aren't any items, but they do offer to restore either your life or your magic gauge for you. You have to press the pause button on the console itself to access your submenu where you can select your different types of magic. They each use a certain amount of points for each use, and you use them by holding down the attack button just like all the other versions of the game. The magic gauge is that bar on the left side of the screen. Oh, and yes, you need to go through the game twice. Do you even need to ask? There's little to no chance of you being fully powered up on your first trip through anyway. The graphics are pretty good for a 2 megabit Master System card. Some stages look pretty close to the Genesis version. The music and sound is about what you'd expect from the console. Still, I really enjoy this take on Ghouls and Ghosts and I have a blast when I play it. I'm of course able to beat the game now and I spend a ton of time scouring each level in order to find all of the treasure chests I can in order to power up. I don't know why, I just like doing stuff like that sometimes. This game is way more fun than I remember it and I'm super glad that I held on to it. Castlevania II Simon's Quest for the NES is another sequel that got a bad rap for quite some time. It was the odd man out, the one you didn't want to think about, the black sheep, not as good as the others. This one tried to be something different for whatever reason, adding backtracking and a few RPG style elements here and there. It was far from a linear game and could almost, almost be classified as a Metroidvania. Oh, I know some of you hate that term. Metroidvania, Metroidvania, Metroidvania! 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 If you're twitching a little bit, this day can be marked down as a success. <laughs> this game was also extremely cryptic, leaving you to almost trial and error to figure out how to progress the game in some spots. Like most people, I didn't like it much back in the day more than an interesting curiosity. But of course the music, which as always is pretty nice. The first and the third game were always light years better. And you know what? They still are in my opinion. However, these days, thanks to walkthroughs and guides that are readily available to literally anybody, going back into this game armed with a little knowledge makes it much more enjoyable. I don't think that this is cheating, especially if it's helping you enjoy a game that you otherwise wouldn't have. What's the harm in that? If you got through this game without any assistance whatsoever, then you were already enjoying this game. There are even some hacks out there that can help make this game a bit more bearable, like retranslations and being able to speed up the day to night to day transitions. The game is still weird though, with you playing as Simon again, having to hunt down Dracula's body parts. Invisible holes in the floor are not cool, but again, you can use maps to see where the holes are if you want. The design could have been much better initially, but as I've said about old games in previous episodes, they were exploring uncharted territory here. There was no established roadmap in game design, so you can't get too upset with the people or company behind this game. I think that you'll find that if you played this game years and years ago with no assistance and didn't care for it, then you'll have much more fun if you try it again these days with one of the many guides that are out there. It's definitely worth playing for sure, and is clearly the progenitor to all of the exciting Metroidvania games that would come a decade later. Unfortunately, the world was not clever or cool enough in 1987 when this came out to coin the term Metroidvania. What do you think? Do you think Castlevania 2 is a Metroidvania? Have you ever played a game that you may have thought was good, but you just kind of blew it off because perhaps you had another game or maybe another two games that were very similar that you felt were way, way better? Well, that's exactly what happened to me with this next one. Anyone remember the TurboGrafx-16 game Bloody Woof? Hell, anyone remember the TurboGrafx-16? Well, if you watch this show, then you probably know what it is by now. Anyway, this overhead run and gun was ported from the Data East arcade game in 1990. When I saw pictures in the magazines, I thought it looked okay. 
Certainly not as good as Rambo 3 on the mighty Sega Genesis, which was also an overhead run and gun. I didn't think anything could top Rambo 3. I mean, it's on the Genesis. That's Rambo, and he's on my Genesis. Around a year later, I finally got around to renting Bloody Wolf. I thought it was good, but nothing really to be excited about, honestly. It was nowhere near as good as Rambo 3, of course. But truth be told, I had played Last Alert on the TurboGrafx-16 CD-ROM before I ever played Bloody Wolf. That's right, Last Alert, the game with anime Rambo, otherwise known as Guy Kazama. I really enjoyed this one and felt that there was no way that Bloody Wolf could ever live up, especially since it was on a wimpy hue card. Sorry, sorry, I mean turbo chip. But some years ago, I ended up picking this game up from a sale on a PC Engine forum. That's when I decided to give it a true effort. And you know what? I really sold this game short with my assumptions back in the 90s. Not only is it super fun in its own way, it might even give Last Alert a run for its money in the fun department. You can get on motorcycles and run over people. Yeah, it looks really wonky, but it's so stupid that it's fun. This game also lets you jump, which adds to the strategy. You can rescue hostages who will sometimes help you and also discover weapons and power-ups in wooden crates. You only get one life, but you can continue as much as you want. And I don't want to spoil too much, but the game isn't necessarily over when you think it is. You're limited to a single player here, but I think that they handled it well. Then again, both Rambo 3 and Last Alert were single player games as well. The biggest knock against this game is probably the lack of overall variety in the stages. I really like the bloody death animations of the enemy, but I've got to give it to Last Alert with the win here, as the enemies do a full spin before they die, and there's even more blood! And if you were alive in the 90s, you know that more blood means it's better. The music is mostly stupid in both Bloody Wolf and Last Alert, and I love it all. Last Alert has some really bad voice acting which adds to the charm, but when it comes to gameplay, Bloody Wolf is definitely up there. I don't know why I didn't give this one more of a chance back in the day, but I'm really happy that it's part of my collection now. The original Streets of Rage on the Genesis was a great game that was released in 1991. Anyone remember 1991? It provided two-player beat-em-up action, which the very large majority of the population enjoyed more than Final Fight on the Super Nintendo, which was released not long after. Then, Streets of Rage 2 came out and raised the bar further than most people thought it could go, and it did this in 1992. Anyone remember 1992? It was, and still is, an incredible game, and one of the best beat-em-ups of all time, bar none. Streets of Rage 3 came in 1994. Anyone remember 1994? Anybody? No one? Okay. Surely, this game would be even better, right? Well, Streets of Rage 2 is definitely a tough act to follow since it was so good. The first several times I played Streets of Rage 3, I was very disappointed. It just didn't seem as cool as Streets of Rage 2. For one, the music went in an entirely different direction which didn't help things. The artwork looked less refined, and it didn't help that Sega of America went in and changed the colors and removed things. Sega of America had a habit of making games worse for North American audiences at that time, and as a result, the game felt less balanced than Part 2. So as you can guess, I didn't play this game very much over the years. But honestly, the game is still really good, even if it doesn't live up to the first two. The fighting action is pretty solid with a few new moves, and six-button support has been added. In previous games, you could dash left and right by double-tapping in a direction. Here, they even let you dash up and down, which can be really helpful. There are even multiple paths later in the game. The graphics are good, but I don't appreciate the gender-neutral colors Sega of America insisted on for some reason. There was absolutely no reason to do this, and as a result, it looks like a Super Nintendo that's been left in the sun too long if you play with Axel and his ugly yellow shirt. Even Blaze got a serious downgrade to plain gray clothes. Hey, 1994 Sega of America, I have a bit of advice. If you have a console that has a limited amount of colors, you need to make sure to use the bold colors to stand out. Also, the enemies no longer flicker when they die in order to protect people from seizures, maybe? But somehow this crazy stage is still in the North American version, so maybe they removed the death flicker for some other nonsensical reason that only makes sense to those employed at Sega of America in 1994? 
Do I have any employees from Sega of America from that time watching this? Please email me and explain this to me. I am dying to know. Well, maybe not dying, but I would appreciate knowing. From what I understand, a large portion of the music was automatically composed by a strange computer program and not a human being. Probably not the best choice in retrospect, but there's still some great music in here. Eventually, I ended up buying the Japanese version, which is known as Bare Knuckle 3, and it's definitely the version to have, but the story is all in Japanese, of course. But at least the colors look nicer, the game's difficulty is more balanced, and nothing was removed. And I'm not just talking about this boss, but this cool intro was even taken out for who knows what reason. You can enjoy the Japanese version without some mom who works for Sega of America trying to protect you from some unseen boogeyman who likely does not wear gender neutral clothing. But I'm still having more fun with the North American version than I recall having all of those years ago. I like that these whip ladies will stay on the ground for a bit before getting back up to fight, which is a nod to the first game. Since time has removed me from the era when this came out, I can be less upset about it not living up to Streets of Rage 2 and just enjoy it for what it is. And it most certainly is enjoyable. I mean, you get to punch a bulldozer and it actually bounces back when you do. How could a game that does this be bad? Answer, it can't. This is where I always died back in the day, but I seem to be getting better at video games as I grow older. I'm no champion or anything, nor do I need to be, but I think that being better than I was helps me enjoy this one more as well. I think a lot of people dislike games that they suck at. There you go, that's a bunch of games that, at least for me, are way better than I initially remember them. How about you? Are there any games that you enjoy more these days than you initially did, now that you're playing them with a different mindset? Or once you dislike a game, do you just double down and hate it forever? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Man, I feel so bad that I broke my Neo Geo stick a few weeks ago. You remember that, right? Well, I've got a new shell that I can put the parts in, so maybe I'll just throw these parts in here and, you know, just be really, really careful from now on when I play Neo Geo games. Anyway, let's get these parts in here. Alright, now let's play some Fatal Fury. Fatal Fury! Nice. I think I should probably choose easy so I don't get, you know, angry. Oh, and of course, every time you play this, you've just gotta choose Humphrey Bogart's great grandson, Terry. Ah, let's do this! Round one! Fight. 